Hello and welcome to another episode of That Catholic Saints Guy. I'm your host, Brian O'Neill. And today we're going to discuss a man who has an, an amazing impact, has had an amazing impact on the church, uh, not only in England, the country where we're going to discuss his, his, the majority of his actions, but really throughout the entire world because of the people that he brought into the church while he was in England, and that is Blessed Dominic Barberi. Today I'm joined by Father Ben Lodge, who is working with the Barberi Beatification or Canonization Cause now, praise God. And uh, Father, Father Lodge, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for being with us. And uh, be why don't you, before we get into the story of Father Barberi, why don't you give us a little bit of your background, please? Well, thank you for the welcome, Brian. I, um, I, I was born a few years ago, um, right beside Heathrow Airport. Um, so many people would see me as a Londoner, but my father was in the, um, he was a principal officer, like a doctor in the prison service. So we got moved around a fair bit and it was, as a result of one of those moves, I met um, a passionist priest begging for money for Sweden. Now that'll sound odd because everybody thinks of Sweden as being so rich and wealthy. But um, the Catholic Church was very, very poor. Most of the work there from the 1950s on was dealing with um, refugees, often from the concentration camps. Or, and later on, by the 70s, they were coming in from Basically, Latin America, um, I, I was very intrigued by um, the whole work. Yeah. And it seemed yeah. very practical. I mean, it was a clear message. Um, God loves us. We know he loves us. Why? Because he allowed his son to be crucified. And a man can have no greater love. So I guess in shorthand, I then went and um, entered with the Passionists, um, and then after my novitiate, we went to London University and did philosophy. Not that I understood any of that. <laughs> and, um, then we did theology. And eventually, um, by the grace of God and mistake of the apostolic see, I was ordained. And then um, within four weeks of ordination, I was sent to Sweden to work there. Um, much of my work was actually with... Um, people from Uruguay, um, often with quite serious mental health issues because of what had been done to them in Uruguay. Mm. Um, then I came back and went into full-time spiritual direction and retreat work, primarily with religious. Um, and then I was moved to be the superior of a big retreat house. Um, and then I was moved on to a parish where Blessed Dominic is actually buried. Okay. Um, and then they discovered that I had a certain skill for dealing with builders and building work. So most of my priestly life has been involved with major building works, um, hmm. you know, rebuilding like 12th century Norman towers, you know, buildings that were put up in 1200 and art and having to rebuild it stone by stone. Um, then I was moved back to London University as chaplain did several years there. And then I was sent to prison um, for six years. Um, I, I was innocent. I was a chaplain, I hope you realize. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I worked with people with drug problems. I worked with um, simple petty thieves and I worked with um, international terrorists. Um, and all the time, doing building work. The only time I wasn't allowed to do any building work was when I was in the prison. Um, I never quite understood why they wouldn't let me build walls, but they had strict rules about who could do the work. Um, from there, it's, um, it, it was a question of just moving around doing um, pastoral ministry. Um, but all the time, um, for about the last 30 years, um, working on the causes of Dominic Barbary and Father Ignatius Spencer. Um, now I'm sort of, I, I moved out of London recently into the Archdiocese of Birmingham, which is a huge long diocese 
the plan was to work in 69 of the parishes where Dominic and Ignatius had worked. But unfortunately, the, the whole plan ha has been mucked up. You, you know, they say, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Well, we told him our plans and um, because of the pandemic, no parish priest would let me into his parish. Really? So it, I'm, I've come back up to the novitiate house, partly in the hope of doing more writing and a bit more reflection and prayer. So that's where I'm at at the moment. Um, up in the northeast of England, um, it's cold, wet and miserable. But it's England, so it's, it's, it's great. God's own country. There you go. Our Lady's Dowry and all that sort of good thing. So it's, it's fascinating work that you do now, which is to promote the, cause, the causes of these two incredible men. Um, and today we're just going to focus on Blessed Dominic because really both, they both deserve their own episode. So please begin, tell us the story of Blessed Dominic. Well, but in, in some ways, Dominic's story is quite simple. I, I often like to think of it in terms of, um, well, I suppose as a student, I thoroughly enjoyed Carol King's tapestry. My life has been a tapestry. And I think it's a brilliant image for so many of these people. If you think of the tapestry that the life of Dominic was woven onto, it was the American Revolution the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, times of tremendous upheaval, people not knowing, a bit like the pandemic today, people not knowing when it's going to end or how it's going to end. Um, I think we're a bit more cautious. I'm not going to get political, but I think we're a bit more cautious in England than um, your leader is in the free world saying when the pandemic's going to close. I mean, we just don't know. And the whole shape of the Industrial Revolution, it, it, it marked a move from a rural agricultural society to an urban industrial society. So if that alone, the whole thing of the American Revolution, don't forget, we ruled you people. I don't think we did such a bad job. You know, you can still more or less speak English. <laughs> and, then, and then we had the French Revolution, and that was a threat to the power, to the establishment, to the aristocracy. So we can't underestimate all of that, because that had a huge influence in the Catholic Church. Yes. The, the Pope was losing territories. You had the erection of the Papal States. So that's the background. So Dominic was born in June 1792 at a little, it would be an exaggeration to say it was a village, it was a hamlet called Palanzano near Viterbo, which you're talking about 50 miles north of Rome. Um, he was one of eight children. Not too much is said about the father, just because he died, and there's very little recorded. The mother obviously had tremendous faith. Um, she had specific devotion to Mary. Um, and constantly she'd remind the children, those that were surviving, you know, if you think I love you, think how much more Mary loves you, much more than I ever could. So, so that was hammered into them, not in a class, but by life, by example, day after day after day. And when, um, I mean, it, they were steeped in the faith. It, it wasn't an add-on. It wasn't an extra. That was their day-to-day -day life. So Dominic records that when he was having his hair cut or, or combed and it tugged, he'd start crying. The mother would point to the crucifix and say, look, that's how much Jesus loves you. So a tremendous sense of the presence of God, the providence of God. But I, I'm sure as children, I mean, they, they were fully human. They might have become divine later, but they were definitely human. They were a bit hacked off. Um, you could use other phrases. When the mother would come home with a sack empty of flour, 
She'd taken corn to be ground down at the mill, and on the way back she met people more deserving. So she gave it away, so there was nothing for them. Um, don't get the impression that they were totally pious in the worst sense of that. Um, Dominic records that he and his sister went um, to get some water from the well and they broke a jug. Dominic started to cry. And um, the sister more or less says, oh, shut up. Wait until you get home and then start crying because mother will assume that it's something far worse has happened. So the wily sister got it spot on. They go home, they start crying. They say eventually that the jug had broken and the mother says, is that all? And gives them a plate of sweets. Hmm? Not daft. <laughs> Not daft. No, so, no. there was no need in the mind of the family for them to be given any formal education. But what was the point? That they were not peasants. It's one of the things that annoy me, and it's, it, it's part of the English church has done this, that they described Dominic as a peasant. He, wasn't, he was peasant stock. And today, we would say he'd be a tenant farmer. The family were tenant farmers. So they weren't poverty-stricken. So they, they were able to take some land and rent it and raise um, some wheat, some corn, some vines, so on. So that they had a, what we would call a, a fairly sheltered upbringing, but certainly no opportunity for education. Dominic quickly discovered that he had a desperate thirsting for knowledge. And so he um, would grab people and teach, ask them to teach him to read. So the local priest was a capuchin. So he taught him the letters of the alphabet. And whenever anybody came, he'd get more and more instruction. I mean, to cut a long story short, I mean, the, the fact that he ended up eventually as a professor of philosophy and a professor of theology, that gives you a clue of the intelligence of man. And it was that that John Henry Newman recognized the fact that they could discuss things in Greek without any bother at all. You know, it shows the sort of intelligence of the man. It proved quite useful in the village because Dominic could read both Italian and French and translate the decrees of Napoleon. Remember, Napoleon was getting lined up to go charging off to invade Moscow in 1812. And that was a disaster. And I think I saw somewhere that 40,000 men left the Papal States conscripted to fight for Napoleon, go invading Moscow. Only 2,000 out of 40,000 returned alive. Wow. So to be conscripted was a terrible, terrible thing. And Dominic was frightened that he was going to be conscripted. And in his prayer, he prayed to his mother, who by this stage had been dead several years. And the mother said, in the dream, go and join one of the local sodalities for the rosary and pray. So he went straight off, signed up, joined up. And when it came to the ballot, um, the, the principle was that those who got the low numbers would be enlisted. He got one of the highest numbers. And so he was never enlisted. He then started to develop his prayer, but he couldn't go very far because he didn't have any real instructors. Um, the Capuchins tried. He'd meet one or two others. And once or twice he met the Passionists. But the problem was the religious orders had been suppressed by Napoleon. We should so stop they, for just a second. And the Passionists are a religious order founded by St. Paul of the Cross, correct? Mm -hmm. yes. what, is their, what is their charism, briefly? Well, Paul of the Cross felt that the church needed to remember that God loved each person. God didn't wait for us to love God. God loved us first. Mm 
And the only adequate response is to love God. Now, the way to do that was to get to know God. And to get to know God, the best way, he said, was to meditate on the passion. So after a long saga, he eventually established the Passionists. And central to their way of life was a life of prayer, meditation, and then going out and preaching missions and retreats. He, he was to spend his life doing that, but originally the congregation he founded was called the Poor of Jesus. The poverty element was so strong that he could not get approval. Even when cardinals read the rule, they said it's very impressive, but no men could live it. And even when he had high friends at court, including cardinals, advocating that the rule should be approved, they all said, but you have to allow some sort of income for at least the student houses. And Paul said, no, if we cannot depend totally on God, then I'm not going to allow the congregation to be founded. So he had this rule of the community had to spend a full community life in prayer. And the ideal was a man could spend six months in community and six months out preaching missions and retreats. Um, interestingly, Paul himself didn't always keep to that because the demands were so great for him to preach. Um, but I mean, he, he presented the ideal. Um, he had a number of visions, um, including seeing Mary dressed in a black habit with um, the Passionist sign. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. Can you, can you get that? Yep, that perfect. So that was, um, Mary had a big influence in shaping this and eventually, Paul established a hermitage on Monte Argentario, which is like a little um, plug of rock out into the Mediterranean um, between Rome and Elba. So he established a hermitage there. Several times he thought he wouldn't succeed in establishing a religious order, but rather just he'd find a community of hermits. But... God's plans were that a congregation would be founded to preach the passion of Christ. And this wasn't a, a gory, messy thing. It was a love story. Paul's phrase again and again, it was the greatest love story. You know, so he focused on the love, not, not on the, the bloodiness and the brutality and the obscenity that was the passion. It was the underlying thing of the love that was so important. And that's basically what he did. He, his order grew at a phenomenal rate initially. Um, a lot went to join, but many couldn't stay for very long. It was just such a tough life. But then he had a vision of starting um, a, a, the Passionist nuns. These were enclosed contemplative nuns. So again, he got those established. He also had a vision um, in St. Mary Major, of seeing his sons working, initially it said, in Northern Europe. And then in a, yeah. subsequent, in a subsequent vision, it was seeing his sons working in England and the surrounding districts. And, and who knows, maybe he saw Dominic, maybe he saw Ignatius Spencer, maybe he even saw me. Um, <laughs> but, but then shortly before he died, um, the brother infirmarian came in and he said, why are you crying? And Paul had said, I think it was his last mass. He said, I've just seen my sons in England. You know, so there's an extraordinary relationship between the Passionists and England, starting with Paul, going through Domni. Now, these two men had never been to England. They would apparently never go to England. It's hard to see how they had any knowledge of England. The most likely explanation is that they encountered pilgrims journeying from England down through France, down through Italy, United Italy as it is now, going to Rome on pilgrimage. Um, it's possible that Dominic had read um, stuff about Thomas, um, 
St. Thomas of Becket, who had been killed, martyred in Canterbury. And he was a very popular saint, well known by all the English. So we're just guessing. We, we can't prove any of this. But that there is this thin, thin thread coming through the tapestry of this connection from Paul of the Cross through Dominic to England. And so with that understood, he's coming to know, he's come across some passionists and does that automatically interest him and then he just goes off to join or was there something that led up to that? No, he, he very quickly, um, Dominic decided he was to be a passionist because of this vision he had. Um, again, he, he was a young man who enjoyed life. Um, he was actually very attractive, um, especially to the women and a number of women had set their eyes on him, you know, he had his own little farm and he wouldn't have been a bad catch to be um, a husband. Um, his uncle, who had taken over responsibility for him, thought, well, yes, we'll organize a marriage. And um, when I die, Dominic will inherit the farm and he'll be set up. Well, Dominic wasn't too happy about this and he announced that he had taken a vow to remain celibate. Well, there was another uncle who was a priest and he thought, well, we'll soon deal with that. So he wrote to Rome and he got the vow dispensed. So Dominic retaliated. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it was quite interesting. There, there's a whole load of stuff going on, but a, anyway, the marriage never happened. Um, and then um, Dominic put things off, but he was ill a couple of times and in the end, he decided I need to enter a religious life. So when he went to enter the novitiate, um, he was a bit disappointed because the first night the um, novice master said, sorry, son, you're not getting in here. There's no bed sphere. To which Dominic said, you watch, there'll be one for me tomorrow night. And sure enough, the next day, one of the newly arrived novices had already left. So Dominic began his novitiate they quickly realized that he had an extraordinary prayer life. But the problem was he had entered the Passionists as a lay brother. In other words, not to be a priest. And there was a fairly strict rule. If you started as a brother, you could not change over midstream to become a cleric going on for priesthood. Eventually, the novice master intervened and talked to the Father General in Rome and uh, the general wasn't keen on it. The provincial, the local superior wasn't keen on it. And the general said, I'll tell you what to do. Give him a psalm to translate and see how he does it. So Dominic translates the psalm so quickly that it's in perfect Italian. And even the master said, I couldn't have done it in the time and to the perfection that he did it. So basically, Dominic went on and developed his studies. Um, eventually was ordained, was made a professor of theology. And so he was moving around the expanding congregation. He, um, he seems to have been a very lovable sort of character. There was no, um, he wouldn't allow any infractions of the rule, but he was quite clear that if they kept the rule, the rule would keep them. That was his basic attitude. So gradually this idea of England begins to emerge. And he has this thing that maybe he'll go. But every time there was a possibility, something happened. So he'd be made a local superior, a rector as they call them. Or he was made the provincial, so in charge of a whole province, a number of houses. Yeah. And a number of his friends knew he had this longing for England. And so they would encourage him. And they said, why don't you go and have a word with the general and say, you think this is God's will? And his attitude was, well, if it's God's will, God can sort it. You know, if he wants me to go, you know, don't leave me to sort it. So th there was a very healthy, d despite these sort of visions that he would have, he was always well grounded very well grounded. So um, 
eventually, I mean, he he'd met a few English people because he was in Rome and an awful lot of English were beginning to travel. They were doing this, um, what they called the Grand Tour. They're often um, students who just finished their university. I, I guess today we'd call it a gap year. And, and they would go off around right. Europe um, for a year. Um, and so um, they'd call in and they'd hear uh, about various communities. And one of the English people was a 70 year old man who, who was a convert and he became a Catholic and he wanted to be ordained. So they needed to educate him and train him how to say mass. Well, of course, Dominic didn't have any English. So they brought in um, a, a layman, um, Ambrose Phillips and Father Ignatius Spencer. And so Dominic had his first real contact with English people. And they trained the man to say the mass, in, obviously in Latin, but he had to be taught in English. And in the process, Ignatius and Ambrose Phillips became good friends with Dominic. But Dominic could go three years then without hearing from them, partly because of the bad postal system. And that was intense pain for him. Eventually, um, Ignatius Spencer went to Rome, was ordained, and on his way back, he was summoned back to England to work in the English mission. He was able to call in and spend a day or two with Dominic um, at Lucca, um, where Dominic was now the superior. Eventually, Dominic um, goes off to England. And he arrives in 1840. Now, there's no great significance about the year, but there is about the date. It was the 5th of November. Okay. which is Guy Fawkes Day, which is traditionally when we would burn images of the Pope. And Dominic, having been led to believe that England was on the cusp of wholesale conversion to Catholicism, was shocked to see images of the Pope being carried along and mud and horse dung thrown at these images and burnt on fires. Eventually, he went up to Oscott College, which still exists. Um, it's the main seminary now for the north of England. And the idea was he could stay there, polish up his English, and then he was to take over a parish up in a little village called Stone in Staffordshire. However, when he was about to go up, he was told, you can't go. The priest who is there is refusing to move out. I never understood why the bishop didn't intervene and say, Oi, pack your bags and go. But Dominic waited. He used the time to improve his English and eventually ended up going to, um, back to Belgium, where the Passionists had established a community, not by way of a mission to Belgium, but by way of a stepping stone into England. Okay. It was a year later that Dominic ends up back again in Oscott and finally is given possession of the house in stone. Um, moves in. When he arrives, he's wearing the Passionist habit. People laugh at him because he's small and squat. And when he tries to preach the first time, remember, Mass would have been in Latin. So in theory, there'd have been no problem saying Mass. But he tried to preach in English and it was a three sentence homily. That'd be a good idea today, again, if they introduced some of those instead of these long <laughs> sermons that we listen to. But he said, um, whatever it was he said, the people just fell about laughing because of his accent. Uh, and that brings us on to another element. Um, Dominic, he could read English, he could write English, but he never learned to speak it very well. His accent was terrible. And I found in the house diaries of the Sisters of Mercy in Handsworth in Birmingham, um, he was giving a retreat and um, they actually recorded the very words he said. He said, my dear sisters, 
I'm not going to try and imitate an Italian screwed up English accent. My dear sisters, without face, you cannot be shaved. True enough. Of course, he meant without faith, you cannot be saved. That same community. Now remember, this is shortly after the um, Irish potato famines. So there was wholesale emigration to England, America, Australia. And many of them who came to England came to work on building the railways and the navigation canals. And that's how they got the name navvies. It's from that word, the navvies. They built the navigation canals. So these were often young Irish men. And as happens whenever people leave their home country, they often fall away from the faith until they're better established. And in this case, um, a lot had fallen away. But the Sisters of Mercy did great work. And they started to get these young men to come back to the sacraments. However, there was a problem. Some of the sisters developed scruples as to why these young men were coming to the convent. And so they went to Dominic in the retreat and they said, Father Dominic, we have concerns about why these young men are all coming to the convent. So Dominic thought about it. And that evening in the talk, he says, my dear sisters, it is very good that you are attracting so many men back to the sacraments, but I understand some of you are very nervous. Sisters, do not worry. You are all far too old and far too ugly. Now, what was interesting, that community invited him back several more times to give retreats. I'm afraid I would never have the nerve to come out with that to a community of nuns, but there you go. That's on really another true. level, again with the accent, when he gave one of the first missions, he records that after the, the sermon, a huge Irishman came into the sacristy, fell at his knees, and said, Your Reverence, I have no idea what language you were speaking in, but the way you said it, the way you held out your arms, I knew that I could go to confession to you. So, so the, the very body language of the man spoke volumes. That's, it's, uh, it shows that holiness will... Um, it breaks through. It, it really does. In, in the United States, there's kind of a similar dynamic with a uh, priest from the Milan area, if memory serves, named Father Mat uh, Samuel Matsukeli. And uh, he was a, a Dominican. And it, his mission field was the state of Wisconsin in the very far north and midwestern part of the, the country. And the uh, it was like with Father Dominic, many of his parishioners were, were Irish and they couldn't quite get his name. So they called him Father Matthew Kelly. So it's, uh, yeah. but, but they were uh, in the same thing. They were, they loved him because they were attracted to his holiness. So mm -hmm. he gets there and he's working with these migrants, uh, these immigrants. What is it that, um, that how, how is his effort to convert the, English people, the natives, the, the Anglicans going? Well, it's important. The baseline was 1829. So it's before Dominic arrives. We had the Catholic Emancipation Act, by which it was no longer illegal to practice your religion. By that, there was a massive boom in building churches. But still, in the 1840s, a lot of churches hadn't been built. And so Dominic would just work his way around. Often, I mean, he would hire a pub. He couldn't do it today because they're all being closed because of the pandemic. He would, he would hire hotel rooms and just say mass there. And sometimes, I mean, the numbers are phenomenal. Uh, maybe he would hire a room in a hotel, 500 people crammed in with 500 more outside. Now this is long before microphone systems. Wow. And so what they used to do was he would do his preaching and then there'd be guys a bit of the way down and they would echo on 
what had been said, and they'd echo it onto the guys outside. Um, you know, there are ways of getting the message out. So there was an awful lot of that. And then he was constantly um, being asked to give um, missions in the churches that had been established. Well, he also <laughs> said mass for the, uh, the family of, or in the home of the family of the servant of God, Teresa Higginson, a baptized her right. older sister, right? Yes. So yes. he's going around and doing, he's going constantly hither and hither. Um, yeah. And in, interestingly, despite the emphasis on poverty, he often used the trains. Now the trains would have been expensive, but the reasoning was, I can get to a place and do more preaching rather than waste my time sitting in a railway carriage. You know, the time was better spent preaching. So he would often sort of begin the day with maybe mass at, well, he'd start often as not hearing confessions for maybe two or three hours. Then say a mass, then more confessions, then there'd be a period of catechesis, then instruction, then more, com more um, confessions, maybe nipping out to the workhouse, anointing the people who were dying. Remember, typhus, cholera, TB, these were rampant. They were the killers as COVID-19 is with us today. Um, but they never held back. They just went in and anointed anybody and everybody who was ill. Let me back up here because in the American experience, unless I'm just hugely ignorant, which is a huge possibility, we don't have uh, something such as a workhouse. Um, I'm familiar with the concept, but I know a lot of people won't be. So could you explain the workhouse a little to us? If you want to read up on it, then read some of the Charles Dickens novels. Dickens deals with it very well. The idea was rather than somebody who was poverty stricken, um, being a burden on the local council or state, they would go and live in the workhouse. And the theory was that they would do a little bit of work and then they would be fed. What they fed wouldn't keep a goldfish alive. You know, it was, it was, it, they were all without exception, very harsh places, um, often quite brutal. Um, so yeah not good and often basically if you went to the workhouse you knew you wouldn't come out except in a shroud wow so yeah so it was really grim so on the one hand you had dominic doing this sort of thing on the other hand he always had an eye on what became known as the tractarian movement this was the high anglicans um Often, um, well, it was rooted in Oxford University and the main figure, of course, became John Henry Newman, um, who, who was um, canonized earlier this year. They, in effect, went back to the fathers of the early church and putting it, I mean, you could write volumes on this, but putting it into two or three lines. What Newman argued was, if we go back to the early church and then trace it through, the Roman church has gone one way, the Orthodox has gone the other way, but hooray for the Anglican church, we've gone the middle way, and that's the way we should follow. Now, where um, Newman got stuck was in going back to the early church, he realized that what some of the fathers had written is not contained in the Gospels. And the whole Church of England thing was, it's only what's in the Gospel do we believe. So if you look, there is nothing about the Trinity. Yeah. Now, we can read in with hindsight and say, well, that was prophetic. There's nothing there. And so Newman, along with a number of other co um, colleagues said there's also the oral tradition. You know, so while a man write, might write a gospel, he could speak something 10 times more, and that could be recorded elsewhere, but not in the gospels. Okay. So it was this that forced him back 
to looking at tradition. And I don't mean we've always done it that way. That's right. not tradition. Right. It's handing on the faith of the gospel, both in the written word as the gospel and in the teaching of the church. So it was in the light of that that Newman eventually came into the church. And it, this is <laughs> it's a bit of a sore point with me because when you mention um, Dominic Barbary, people associate him with Newman. Newman was only a footnote in the life of Dominic Barbary. You know, whereas he's often treated as a footnote in the life of John Henry Newman. They've got it the wrong way around. And it was Ooh. Newman who recognized what a tremendous character. And I mean, Newman had said, unless we see Catholics going around the industrial cities barefoot, it's all words, no action. And of course, when he started to see the Passionists going around barefooted, that was it. And Newman writes several times, the very appear appearance of Domni filled him with an extraordinary sense of there was something special here. So Dominic is on his way from the North Midlands, north of England, heading down to go to a provincial chapter in Belgium. And on the way down, he calls into Oxford, to Littlemore. In fact, I was supplying there in the parish next door two weeks ago for three months. And Dominic, to save money, had himself tied on to the top of the stagecoach so they basically treated him like a big case. And it was a lashing rain. And when he arrived, they untied the ropes and he just stood and dripped all over the place. He came in, and it's one of my criticisms of Newman, and I could be shocked for saying this, but I'll say it anyway. Poor Dominic comes in soaking wet, cold, starving and hungry, and goes and stands in front of the fire. And the steam coming off him. Newman doesn't wait. He just drops at his knees and says, Father Dominic, I wish to be received into the church. Now, what's interesting is Dominic begins the confession. They seem to get halfway through. And then it's not clear, but I get the impression Dominic says, well, I think it's time you went to bed now. I want to get dried and get something to eat. And so they finish the whole process the next day with two others being received in at the same time. So I say that that's the one that's been the best documented in terms sure. of the life of Domni. It's only a tiny thread in that whole tapestry of his life. So Dominic was concerned with establishing communities, but not only did quite a few leave because the life was so severe. In fact, the general intervened at one point and said, the province will not grow. In England, it's too tough for them. And England formed one province with Belgium. Mm -hmm. But there was strong resistance to any change in England, whereas apparently a number in Belgium wanted change to take place. And so the general gave permission for them to wear socks. Right. Very interesting. Right. A number of men left Belgium to, because they wanted to be full passionists, not half passionists um, and it, it, it was I mean we can laugh at the idea of socks sure. Ignatius Spencer for years was crippled with um, chilblains um, so much so that he wasn't able to wear shoes or sandals mm. he, he just wore bandages in effect so the, it, it was a very very tough life and often the, the, you know they were on starvation diets mm -hmm. so we, we have a list in most of our communities up on the wall. And when you look at those who died, they were all very, very young men. Um, there was a, a famous one called Father Paul Mary Packenham, um, who's related to Earl Longford. It, it's interesting to see how men from extremely wealthy families were attracted to the poverty of the Passionists. Ignatius Spencer from one of the probably five wealthiest families in Britain. He wanted to join. Paul and Mary Packenham, um, related to the Duke of Wellington as well as to the Longfords. He, um, he entered, 
He eventually was ordained and was appointed the rector of Mount Argus, which is the big passionist retreat uh, or community in Dublin. He was dead within three years. Um, really? A lot of it was, I think, down to malnourishment. Although that sounds as if they were reckless. Dominic said to one group of students who tried to be quite severe in their thing, he says, while I don't mind paying for the butcher and the baker, I will not pay for the doctor. You know, in other words, you've got to use prudence and be sensible. So Dominic saw men come, saw men go, saw men come over and die. Um, and of course, he, ha he had to run so many different positions as the superior, as the novice master, as the preacher of missions, as the spiritual director. It, and this is a, a man who had five hernias. You know, now if you've ever had a hernia, one is enough to stop most people working. Uh, five, it's incredible how he managed to survive. Yeah. So, he, but all the time he's out preaching missions whenever he could. He only ever got to Ireland once to preach a mission, and that was with Father Ignatius Spencer. But he was preaching all over the Midlands, in particular of England, um, and every so often having to go over to Belgium. So that they spent very, very little time in terms of stable communities. It was um, really... Um, and a heroic life. It wasn't a one-off gesture. And it's po been pointed out that while most of his life was spent in Italy, that's when he did most of his work for England because all the frustration, all the patience needed, all of that was offered up because at the end, he, he only spent about eight years working in England. So it was a huge challenge. Eventually, I mean, coming towards the end of his life, he knew that the end was coming and um, he was to go over to the west of England to visit a pastoralist community there. And uh, Father Louis, who had just come back from the failed attempt to create a mission in Australia, said, can I come with you? And Dominic was very clear, he says, no, it's against poverty. It costs too much. But Dominic went off that night and prayed in the chapel and the next day he met Father Louis and said, you're going to come with me. So they got on the train out of London and they arrived in Reading when Dominic had a massive seizure. Um, they managed to take him off the train and the doctor said, yes, it's a huge heart attack, but he'll come out of it. And Dominic knew he wouldn't. So um, <coughs> he was able to go to confession, receive the last sacraments, from Father Louis, um, and again, it's, it's an extraordinary story, but eventually um, he died about three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, it, it was very, very sad, but they took the body first back to London. And it, the, the thing is, the people of Reading wouldn't allow him to go into a house to die because they knew he'd come off the train from London and London was rife with cholera. And so they wouldn't allow the risk of contamination, you know, self-isolation as we call it today. So they, they took the body there and then they took the body up to stone. And in marked contrast to when he arrived and the people stood on the streets throwing stones and spitting at him and cursing him. And there were thousands lining the streets, which, you know, it's quite impressive. It shows the influence that the man had. However, it left another problem because one of the things that Dominic had done was he had gone up to St. Helens. Up, St. Helens is on the railway line between Liverpool and Manchester. And it was seen as a good place to hit the two main industrial cities in the north. And for Father Ignatius Spencer, it was also good because it gave him quick and easy access to the port so he could get the ferry to Ireland. That is great apostolate was over in Ireland. So they went and they found this land and it was given to them. And um, Ignatius Spencer said, we're going to build it there. And Dominic said, no, we're going to build it there. And that's where eventually the monastery was built because Dominic said, this will be my final resting place. 
And so today he's buried there in the church of St. Anne and Blessed Dominic. And on one side of him, he's got Father Ignatius Spencer. And on the other side of him, he's got Mother Elizabeth Prout, both of whose causes are up um, for beatification at the moment. When I was doing some research, there was something to the effect of um, being in stone uh, and it being an aptly named Oh, he was stoned. That was when he yeah. arrived. And he literally, as he walked down and they laughed at him, they spat at him. And there, there is one account of a stone being thrown and hitting him on the forehead. And um, he picked the stone up and kissed the stone. But they say that the scar was on his head until he died. Kind of the, his own mark of the passion, if you will. Uh, the passion of Dominic. What... Um, what do you think has been the impact of Blessed Dominic on the church in England and even the universal church, even to this day? Cardinal Bourne, who was the Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, said, I think it was in the early 1930s, if it was up to me, I would make Dominic Barbary patron of the Archdiocese of Westminster. It was, you see, we're, we're familiar with words like ecumenism. In the days of Dominic, there was no way you could even attend the funeral of your best friend if they weren't Catholic. You couldn't go into a Protestant church. Dominic quietly worked away and it became a whole thing of passionists in England. Ignatius Spencer, that was his primary apostolate, working for unity in the truth, that they may be one. These are phrases he's using all the time. So I, I would say that it was the whole ecumenical thing. That was the big thing. And also Dominic was determined, like Paul of the Cross, that we wouldn't take on parishes. Okay. However, however, the bishops would not allow the religious orders into England. So we're talking primarily of the um, Passionists, Rosminians, Redemptorists. The only way they'd allow them in, because these are all Italian, would be if they allowed them, to, or if they agreed to take on parishes. So, but Dominic wasn't happy with this because it stopped going out on missions. You know, you, you can't start a mission and then say, sorry, I've got to go home to say weekend masses. You know, it, it just, so that, that was a big, big issue. And um, I suppose it's caused trouble ever since. Um, should we be running parishes? Um, the idea of the traditional parish mission going in and taking over a parish for three weeks and visiting and preaching, that, that no longer works. Um, okay. But I mean, I mean, I'm not sure what would have developed. So, so we have both in England um, parishes and retreat houses. Um, yeah. On the universal church, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not competent to sort of. I'm not a church historian, or I'm just a guy who got caught in the wrong place at the wrong time by the provincial and was told to do this job. So here you are. So here I am. Did he have a we know that he had some relationship with John Henry Newman. Did he have a, uh, any sort of relationship with Nicholas Cardinal uh, Weissman or Cardinal Manning? <laughs> Not with Manning. Not with Manning, okay. Manning. Um, he knew Weissman because Weissman was the rector of the English college in Rome, the Venerabile. Mm-hmm. And he would have met him when Ignatius Spencer went there. Um, Spencer was about four years older than Wiseman. But um, Wiseman was spending his time studying Syrian manuscripts and treaties on geology, which was what they were doing in England if you were an Anglican. And so Ignatius Spencer got quite annoyed and attacked Wiseman, even though they were very good friends, 
And he said, stop wasting your time on Syrian manuscripts and geological treaties and prepare yourself for work on the English mission. So Dominic would have got to know him there. Um, but again, Dominic, I think, was shrewd to, he never became the favorite of anybody. He was very clear in what he was to do. He, he would get help, he'd accept help, but not at any price. I understand that the whole reason for the Tractarian movement founded by John Henry Newman and others was because the church in England, the Anglican church, had become the Church of England, I should say, had become what we would today call modernist. You know, it's it, all paths are great, to, are just mm -hmm. equally valid to God and, and this sort of thing. And that one of the things Blessed Dominic encountered was not only the need to convert uh, the, in, you know, wanting to convert England, but the need for conversion amongst Catholics. Uh, and also the need for conversion just amongst Protestants, that they had kind of lost their sense of Christ as their savior and had fallen away kind of from that basic core Trinitarian sort of understanding uh, to that's, some degree or another. Is that true? That's, I, I would say that's certainly true, but the, I don't think you can take that from what Dominic did. That there's some, Ignatius Spencer goes through that in great detail. Okay. Um, one of, yes, you're, you're right. The Church of England had become lax, so much so that individual pastors just interpreted it as they wanted. So say you had, um, say you had seven Protestant pastors and you lined them up and you said, right, what do you understand by the Eucharist? The first one might say, it's a commemorative act of 2,000 years ago. And the second one, what do you understand by it? I believe the full Roman position, Jesus Christ is truly present under the appearance of bread and wine. And you ask the third one, what do you believe? I believe it depends on the faith of the individual. And, and so it goes along. So you get different answers. And this was one of the things that absolutely destroyed Ignatius Spencer. He, he said, how can they speak? We can't all. And this was the thing, unity in the truth. He said, we've got to have the one thing and we've got to be clear on it. So Dominic, Dominic would have been a lot more Roman. But crucially, he was always, I mean, he wrote a very famous letter um, to the professors of Oxford University. It's a very, very long one. Um, but there are accounts of the Oxford men reading it and falling on their knees and thanking God because they saw the Catholics as the enemy. And yet to see this letter coming over as a loving, caring mother, they were completely thrown by it. It's beautiful. What is the lesson for, of Dominic's life for the average Catholic today, would you say? Why is he a good example for us to emulate in the universal church as opposed to the particular? Right. Don't build walls, build bridges. I know that might take on a particular meaning in the States now because of Mexico and so on, but no, I'm not being political. He always felt if you talk to people, you know, be quite clear, you know, you can say, well, I can't agree with that. I disagree with that. If you're quite clear and it's the way you do it, you don't go out to win. You don't go out to batter somebody into the ground. That, that's Dominic's whole thing. Um, he, even, even when he famously gave a mission with Ignatius Spencer, Remember, Spencer was a convert Anglican clergyman. And Ignatius really played on his name of Ignis, meaning fire. And he attacked, he attacked Dominic. I mean, this is the guy who'd lived for so long in Italy, longing and praying for England. And he attacks 
Dominic, and he says, I think, Father Dominic, you've lost your enthusiasm for conversion of England. And it's interesting, it shows how Dominic and Ignatius saw things. Dominic wanted to go gently. And he said to Ignatius, a little less heat and a bit more warmth. A little less heat. You don't have to do hellfire and brimstone. It doesn't work. It might be good entertainment for 10 minutes. You know, we, we've all seen the old mission priests doing that. Think, oh, I don't want to go to hell. Not, not if it's like that. You know, <laughs> but Dominic says, no. Gentle, gentle, gentle. Warmth. Because if you're trying to convince them of a God who loves you, the last thing you need to do is scare the hell out of them. Well, to your it's point, really it was distorting. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, we want to be hell-bent on heaven and not hell-bent on just avoiding hell. I mean, there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. But um, the there's this wonderful story kind of to your point about how he's walking, I think it was through stone, it could have been somewhere else, and a Protestant minister of some sort is haranguing him and just spewing all of these anti-transubstantiation arguments at him about, you know, dealing with the Eucharist. And Ignatius, uh, not Ignatius, Dominic just keeps his silence until the very end as the man's about to turn and walk away. He says, Christ said, this is my body. He didn't say, no, this isn't my body. Or something to that effect, and uh, if I've got the story wrong, please correct no, me. No, no, I mean, that's just, about But right. it's that sort of soft approach. You know, he could have yes. gone back and forth and gotten into a huge argument, but he waits until the man has exhausted all his venom and spewed out all of this vitriol, and then he says, "Ah, but what about this?" I, no, you've got, you've got the guts of it, Brian. But what that guy did, the the pastor, he actually set up a series of talks that were designed to follow straight on from Ignatius, from Dominic preaching. And so he would basically counteract what had been said. And of course, he became so vitriolic that even the, the most loyal of Protestants stopped going and so he had to stop the course of sermons. <laughs> it was, but it's, it's like they developed a technique. Um, Ignatius Spencer tells the story of how he was accused of being um, a turncoat because he'd been an Anglican minister. Mm. And Ignatius says what happened. He was in Liverpool and he said he was an old seaman who had lost his arm. And the seaman's attacking Ignatius for leaving the Anglican church. And Ignatius says to him, well, let's put it this way. Say you're working on a ship which you believe belongs to the king. And he's flying the king's colors. And after a bit, you discover that, in fact, the guy running the ship is a pirate. And he's flying under false colors. And then a proper... Not jump off the side and over to that. And Ignatius says, the point was made. That was the end of the argument. It's beautiful. And you see, yeah, neatly done, no argument. But he, he, let, he let the man and let him work it out for himself. But that, that was their technique. It, it wasn't ranting and shouting hellfire and brimstone at them all the time. Right. And sometimes we just need to acknowledge that the Holy Spirit works as he will, when he wills. And uh, that is, we just have to sow the seed the best that we can and leave it to him to bring up the fruit. Father Ben Lodge, thank you so much for being with us today. I really, really appreciate uh, your, your giving us su such wisdom and insight into the life of Blessed Dominic Barbary. And folks, thank you for joining us. Please come back again. In the meantime, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button, hit like, thumbs up. We always need those, love those. And if you have any comments or questions or want to see other subjects in the future on this program, by all means, leave those in the comment section and we'll do what we can. Thanks so much. And we'll see you again next time on That Catholic Saints Guy.